William Hopefully, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Welcome to Lambda Weekly. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Laurent Landis, and screwing us all up today is the late Patty Fink, who was here real early. Very early. <laughs> I don't know. I did throw you guys off. You did. You did. We didn't even get our, uh, hey, I'm running late text today. So, so what yeah. was that about? You're well, usually I, prompt. I, I texted it. You just didn't see it. You're usually prompt about sending us a text that you're running late. So I thought something was wrong. I was worried. <laughs> Our guest today is Brandy Chambers. She is running for Texas House District 112. Uh, that's a district in Garland. Is it completely in Garland? No, it's the north house, half of Garland. Ah. So the set, it's kind of Garland shaped similar to Kidney Bean. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you just kind of cut that in half, go north to the county line, that's most of my district. Okay. Uh, running against Angie Button, who's been there? Ten years. Ten years. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Brandy's a, an employment attorney and has an opinion on just about <laughs> everything that going Whether on in the Whether you like state. it or not. Yes. Um, tell us I like your opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, she's against health care and education. If I got yeah. it right, yeah. I, I don't know oh, if no. I was something listening. Like yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, tell us a little bit about what encouraged you or inspired you to run. Well, it's kind of a long, drawn-out story, but to... We have an hour. Sum, okay. <laughs> Uh, to sum it up, I guess I was shell shocked after what I call the Trump Trump apocalypse um, on in November of 2016, and like I was literally shocked. I couldn't speak. I was dramatically devastated and, and depressed. And my daughter just kind of looked at me and says, "What are you going to do?" And that kind of stuck with me. And then I'm like, "What am I going to do?" What can I do? What what can I do? Because I can't keep living in this depressed state and then watch our democracy die. And uh, and I also started realizing and hearing all the hatred and divisiveness um, and discrimination that was being broadcast out of D.C. being echoed by the leadership in Texas. And I started paying more attention to that because you know, usually beforehand, I paid a little bit of attention, but not a lot. I was like, you know what, Texas is Texas and whatever, whatever. Um, and so then I started realizing, I was like, wait a minute. So we need to make sure that Texas does not follow Washington. Mm -hmm. And from what I'm seeing in, in my neighbors and in my community and in Texas, that is not truly who we are. So I started paying attention to that. And then in, uh, it was when Barack Obama was giving his farewell speech. And he sat there and said, if you don't like what's going on, get a petition, get some signatures and get your name on the ballot and do something about it. And right then and there, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. My mother saying always, she always said, if you don't like it, fix it. No one's coming to save you. No one's gonna change it. So if you don't like it, you have to go and fix it. Save yourself. And that's what I knew. I was like, I've got to try to fix it. How do I try to fix it? I have to have a seat at the table. How do I get a seat at the table? i got to run. I have to run. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at, okay, what can I run for? And then I looked at uh, Representative Button's seat, and I realized in 2008 she had a Democratic opponent. It was a differently drawn district. She won. 2010? 12 and 14 no democrat showed up to run against her yep and that's when i started really looking around and going okay why is texas so far right and it's leadership. and you're in dallas county which is one of the I, yeah and i'm in, in dallas state. county exactly right. i'm in dallas county and I'm like why is the leadership so like why are the crazy people are the ones that are getting all the attention and setting the agenda in texas and i realized it's because no democrats are standing up to run I mean, there's a few. Now, to be fair, there's a few. When, when when Democrats controlled the state, we had our share of crazy people. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we didn't have any I'm Sid Miller, know. though. Uh, we had our <laughs> share of crazy people. <laughs> Don't disown that. <laughs> All right. So, 
Well, okay, I wasn't here then. I'm a, I'm a transplant. So, and that's when I realized, okay, I got to stand up and run. I don't have a choice now. It's not a decision. It's a duty because I know better. I know that we can be better and I know that we deserve better. And so I've got to stand up and run. And it really encouraged me because in 2016, when a finally a Democrat ran against Representative Button, he was asked to run by the Democratic Party. He was 75 years old. He was retired. He has some health issues um, that would impair his ability to block walk. And he did the best he could. He got $6,000 the entire history of his campaign. He had no online or social media exposure whatsoever. And he got 43% of the vote wow. in my district. Oh, wow. 43. So that tells me my district is yearning for an option, for, for change, mm -hmm. for something different than what we've had. That's kind of like Pete Sessions, who didn't have an opponent, it didn't have a Democratic opponent, and he won with 60-something percent of the vote. That's without... <laughs> yeah, without having an opponent. Yeah, exactly. And so that's when I was like, okay, I, I have to run. This is what I have to do. It's not a decision. It's a duty. It's like, it's kind of like I felt like I was drafted because I then had the knowledge that gave me the ability to say, I've got to do this because no one else is standing up to do it. So what's your strategy to win? My strategy, um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, my strategy, quite honestly, is to be myself. 100%, I'm trying to get out in the community in so many different ways. I'm heavy on social media. Uh, I've got a pretty decent print campaign I'm, I'm doing. I'm reaching out to different minority groups and different community groups because my entire theme of, of my um, campaign is Believe in Branding. And I do that because the very first thing that I did when I decided I was gonna run is I put together my belief structure and put it on a website. Because I truly think that if you know somebody's heart and you know where they're coming when they're making their decisions, you will figure out where they stand on any issue, whether it's been addressed or not. And then that way, you know, if you know their heart, then you know whether you can trust that person to make the right decision on behalf of your community. So that's the very first thing. And so I titled it, I Believe. And since then, I'm realizing that just like with the inspiration with the Women's March and just like the inspiration with the kids from Parkland and March for Our Lives, if we believe in a better tomorrow, we can have that better tomorrow. We just have to put our beliefs into action. It's when we stop believing that everything starts to fall apart, right? And that's when the fascists start taking over and that's when we start losing our rights and we start losing our democracy because when we give up hope, we, we have resigned to our destiny. So if we believe in better, we believe we deserve better, then we will have that. So what kind of, um, you've been block walking, obviously, um, in your sleep, perhaps, even. <laughs> the bruises um, might prove that, yes. Um, what kind of reaction are you getting in the district? Like, what, what, kinds, what kinds of um, um, reactions when you, when you talk to mm -hmm. a, a voter sure. who maybe hasn't voted in a long time or is surprised to see a Democrat knock on their door? I get three reactions, mostly. One reaction is, I don't talk politics, we're not talking politics, I don't care, whatever, go away. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, it's 90 <laughs> degrees out here. Thank you for making that worth it. But at least somebody um, came to their door and introduced themselves. Right, you know, that person if, can't if, that, say again, if that, you well, know. But yeah. that person can't say again, nobody's ever contacted me. That's true, that's true. Right. So there's, there's, there, there's one segment. The other segment, I can't read. They just kind of, they're very polite. Mm -hmm. And they're like, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Like it, it, I have absolutely no idea where they fall on the spectrum of things. And then I get this other um, reaction, which is anywhere between, oh, my God, thank you so much for being a Democrat and running. Oh, thank you so much for sticking your neck out there. Oh, thank you so much for showing up. Um, or I've been a Republican all my life and the Republican Party has left me. I'm not ready to call myself a Democrat, but I know I'm not a Republican anymore. And... You know, I've got a lot of friends that are Republicans, and I think historically the Republican Party and the Democratic Party were just came came at things differently, but we could still have that common ground. Um, but now that the Republican Party has become a party of Trump, for the main part of it, there is truly your a large segment of the population that is being left out. And so I'm able to speak to that because yes, I am a bold progressive. 
and I will stand up and talk about women's rights and demand women's rights. And I will stand up and talk about gun sense um, ownership. And I will stand up and talk about, you know, human trafficking. And I will stand up and talk about all the things that make us uncomfortable. But at the same time, I'm a mediator and my training in life also as a counselor for, for companies is to see both sides of the issue. You can't, you cannot respond to conflict if you only see one side of the issue. You have to see it from all sides in order to be able to come up with a solution. So in so many ways, I am more centrist um, and able to make that connect with what would historically been seen as the conservatives. Um, not alt-right conservatives, but right. that's more not cons conservative. Yeah, you know what I would that, say now in this day and age is more moderate than anything. That, that alt-right garbage is no, yeah, that's it, it is just extremist, and mm -hmm. that's not what somebody is truly concerned. It's not fiscally conservative. No. It's not socially. It's none of that. It's it's, it, it's yeah. fascist. Is, yeah, is I think what it is. completely. You know, one of our. Uh, but that, even though it, it's not that's like extreme conservatism or you don't want to call it conservatism at all, it does exist and unfortunately it seems to actually be growing. Um, how I do you? Know. I don't know if I agree with that. Really? Here's I, what I would agree: it's becoming more obvious. So I think my version and my belief is that that has been there; it has just not been broadcast. Mm -hmm. Good point. But when you see that. Um, there's actual um, people who pledge, and you know they're not even hiding behind it anymore. Actually, running for legislation seats around the country. Mm -hmm. I don't know. To me, I don't know. They're if emboldened. Growing, they, they are emboldened. Right. But how do you even? Um, you know, you say you, you have to see it from both sides. How do you even see it from that side? How do you even have a, a reasonable dialogue with somebody like that? Um, quite on, Yeah. Well, I was gonna say. Uh, <laughs> It, it's difficult because generally, in order to have a productive conversation, you need to be able to start out on equal playing field of a, like a base acceptance of something. I call them facts. Um, and so it's very difficult to have a conversation with somebody that if you're both emotional, it's not gonna work. Okay, um, I have had a very, very lengthy conversation with a lady that um, is a strong proponent of Trump, listens to Rush Limbaugh all day, who happens to be an African-American female. Yes, <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, what? What did you say, what, what, wow. who, what? But because we were in a professional environment and someone that I have to see on a very regular occasion I knew that if I got very emotional and passionate, like I tend to do, that was not going to be productive. Of course. And so I sat there and we had a very civil conversation. Um, I was very careful about the words that I chose as to not be judgmental or condescending. And she was just the same way. And we were able to sit there and have a call. We actually did find a little bit of common ground. Uh, on Black Lives Matter issues and uh, responsibility of law enforcement and, and, and cultural issues regarding that. On many other issues, we differed. But because I was able to sit there and have a professional, respectful conversation, we were able to finally find that common ground. And I mean, that's my training. That's what I have to do in mediations. Um, because if you go in in mediation and you're villainizing one side or condemning one side or judging the other side, you're going to get nowhere because automatically defenses go up. Mm -hmm. You know, people get stuck in the ground. They put they lock their feet in the ground and they're like, I'm not moving because you're attacking me. And I think that's what has happened in the society right now is everyone's got their fences up. Everyone's got their stakes in the ground and going, I'm not moving because you're attacking me. And when we do that, we're not hearing the true issues that are going on on the other side. Former State Representative Harriet Earhart's been on our show a number of times. And one of the things she said was that when she went into the legislature, the thing that both parties had in common was they wanted to pass legislation that would help the most people. And she said the best legislation they ever wrote was with when the conference committees would get together and actually listen to each exactly. other. Because they'd have some ideas that would help some more people on their side 
she'd have ideas that would help more people on her side. And if you put that all together, you're coming up with better legislation. It might be a little bit broader or you take things out that might hurt somebody when you hear the other side. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you have to do is listen. Exactly. And, and she and, said I that mean, just this, didn't even happen then. <laughs> yeah, well, and that and that is not what's happening now because mm -hmm. the the rhetoric and the hyperbole and the um, it's not me, it's you. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's coming at us a million miles an miles an hour. I mean, and and so at some point you either shut down and just go, no, we're not. I can't. No, and or you push back. And that's where we are. And it's hard. I think it's going to be hard for us to have a cultural shift as long as we have the Twitter in chief setting the tone of that divisiveness and not he is not willing to listen to anybody's mm -hmm. side. And all he wants to do is cast blame and call names. So as long as we have a leader setting that tone it is going to be extremely difficult for us as a society and as a democracy to stand up and try to overcome that and sit down and be like, let's, let's stop with the emotion and let's calm down. Remember, we're all human. We're all on this planet together. This is a big boat, you guys, and we're all going to have to fit because we don't have another choice. Mm -hmm. So let's start listening to the actual issues. Because when people are saying, oh, we've got, you know, white people rule, minorities are horrible, or immigrants are horrible, you know what that is? That is an internal fear that we've got to get to the base of. What are you, where are you feel for for? Like, where are your fears that, that's stoking that? Let's, let's address that instead of the symptom. And we need to take a break. We're talking to Brandy Chambers. She's running for Texas House District 112. That's up in the northeast East county. part of yeah, the Dallas county. county. Um, it's District 112. Um, this is Lambda Weekly, and we'll be back with more right after this. I'm Dallas City Councilman Adam Medrano, and you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. And this is Lambda Weekly, and I'm Dave Taffet here with Laurent Landis and the late Patty Fink. Our guest is Brandy Chambers, who is running for uh, the Texas House of Representatives, District 112. Um, Patty, go ahead. Um, I was just, we were just talking in the break about um, your opponent, Brandy, and, um, and her history of voting in the legislature. Um, it's a, it's not awesome. pretty for our community. It is not. At, it's not pretty all. for a lot of communities, actually. It's, um, as I was telling you, she's a woman who votes against women. She is an immigrant who votes against immigrants, and she says that she's a very strong proponent of public education, yet she continually votes to defund it. Um, she, in no way, shape, form, or fashion is a friend to the LGBTQIA commu uh, community at all. Um, actually, most communities, she's not a friend. Yeah, but to bathrooms. Oh, you know, we're worried about bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't particularly care who uses what bathroom as long as I get my peace and quiet. I hope you didn't mind. I know you used our restroom before the show. Yes. And we only have one. It's a. I know. You know, you know I'm fine with that. Yeah. Do, do you know when people say to me, people using the same bathroom, can you believe? How can that happen? And I say, well, I grew up in a house with one of those. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Didn't yeah. You? My gosh. Did, I'm trying to think. You know, uh, I mean, I, no. my household is one of those now. Well, exactly. Yeah. So I have, I have a, it's not that those far in an idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that far in an idea. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's so. amazing, isn't it? And, and nothing you're, you're, bad like has you've happened You've never there. been attacked in there, never, right? Wow. Never. So, That's crazy. Yeah. But, uh, Someone needs to tell Dan Patrick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he probably has signs on the outside of his bathrooms in his house. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what would you like to do for public education? I mean, in Texas, it's a mess. Oh, it is a mess. Uh, we need to really revamp a lot of things with public education. First and foremost, though, that we need to properly fund it. Uh, in 2011, the legislature voted to take away $5.6 billion of the state education uh, fund for public education. and since then has continued to continue to decrease the proportion. So the way it was originally intended is that there are two uh, participants, if you will, in creating the state education budget. And one is to be funded by the state by 
So the state is supposed to carry this load in 50%. Then the localities through your property taxes are supposed to fund the other 50%. That's the way it's supposed to work out. That's what your property taxes are for. Well, in 2011 and since then, they have the state portion has been defunded down to now we are participating at a rate of 37%. Mm. Okay. So here's the problem in that is that the need for resources is not decreasing. Our population is increasing. Mm -hmm. The need for resources between 2000, 2000 and 2010, Texas population increased by 5 million. And that's when they took the that's money, took the out. billions, out of the budget. Right. And we have continually, especially in North Texas, I mean, with a, with a bringing over the huge hub at State Farm and Toyota mm -hmm. and a couple of other major industries that have come in, we are increasing greatly and especially where you're receiving a lot of influx from Oklahoma and surrounding areas due to their low uh, public education funding. So our need has increased, but the state's portion has decreased. So that means who's going to make up the difference? So that's why the property, property taxes, taxes keep going are up. going up exponentially. Big time. Exponentially. So much so. <laughs> Some people aren't even able to afford their homes Correct. anymore. There's a lot of people in my district because my district is uh, North Garland, a little bit of Richardson, Saxe, and Rollette. So those in the Saxe area where they've had a great increase in property taxes, some of them are having to leave that area because they can no longer keep up with the property taxes. So when I'm talking to people, like you were asking, what are you hearing? And people are going, what are you going to do about them with property taxes? Well, as a state legislature, I cannot directly or I'm not supposed to directly influence what a locality can do because they're their own taxation authority. We're not supposed to touch that. So I can't and shouldn't, in my view, say, hey, city of garland you don't raise your taxes <laughs> and even if i did that means we're capping our resources completely mm -hmm. and we're taking the power of the city to know what is best for them so i don't like that but what i can do as a state legislator is may hey state stop giving all these corporate tax cuts that are being paid for out of our state f uh, education fund because it's going on the backs of that let's make sure that we're taxing fairly and we're not putting one burden on anybody else refill that bucket back to 50 percent and that will at least relieve the pressure on the locality to make up that 67 percent you know i always find it interesting when a city is you know desperately bringing all these companies in and they have absolutely no plans to add any infrastructure, mm -hmm. to add schools, to add, and it's not the city that adds right. the schools, but it's the ISD that does. But none of the local governments, they all want these new businesses in. They just don't want to make sure that we can take care of those people once they're here. I right. just don't And get as that. long as we want to continue to be a desirable location for, for others to increase our business and to increase our population and make a more successful Texas, what do people look for? When you're looking for a house, what do you look for? Good public schools mm -hmm. or good schools. That's what you look for. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you, I guarantee you that the people in Toyota, when they were like, which state are we going to relocate to? What are we looking at? What kind of infrastructure can, can be brought to the people um, mm -hmm. of our company? So unless we step it up and start living up to our constitutional duties and actually making public education a priority then we're going to start losing that influx mm -hmm. and we are going to stop being a desirable area and then people are going to be fleeing instead of coming so when we have people flee we're losing taxation again so it none of the, we have to look at the picture in its entirety mm -hmm. you know no one likes to pay taxes i hate paying taxes i can't stand it but you know what i like i like public schools I like to have an informed populace with skills to be able to be successful. Yep. I like having roads that I don't have to dodge like a <laughs> obstacle course. You know, I, I like having firemen show up to my house with my house is on fire. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm like, okay, I'll pay some taxes, mm -hmm. you know, to pay my fair share. Well, I think that's the primary difference between, say, Republicans and Democrats. Democrats see in taxation as, as investment.
right. investment in community, investment in infrastructure, and all those things that make a community. And the GOP doesn't. They just see less, less, less be- because it's they a don't. It's a burden. Right. All taxes are a burden, An burden, which is insane. Absolutely insane. And this idea that, you know, you know, Aaron and I don't have kids, but I think it's proper and I'm eager uh, to participate in paying taxes for the Dallas Independent School District yes. because I want good schools. And I, we do have a great school, schools in our, our neighborhood, but one of the things that just chaps me is that the budget of the state is a, is a statement of priorities and values. Exactly. And obviously the state does not value public education for our children. And they want to move that money to be used by a very, very elite few to say, my bill to put my kid for one year in some very chi private school, even in Dallas, is say $50,000 a year. And so I'm going to get a $7,000 voucher right. and then put it toward that. But nobody... And who just got the seven thousand dollar voucher could have put their kid in a school any, mm-hmm. anywhere. It's just not going to happen. Right. This is all intended to, just like it is nationally, uh, to feed the the rich and the wealthy and the one percent. Um, and and so I don't understand why they think um, they can bring their business or build their business in Texas with a with a workforce that has not been properly educated. I, I don't even understand that. I don't think that. they care. You know, the other part they of it, though. But would you, wouldn't you think they care if, if their business relies on a good, educated workforce? And all businesses do. You know, and that's the thing when... that One thing about being gay, they always say to you, oh, well, why would you care about, you know, you should be a Republican because you shouldn't care about educating kids. You don't have any. Um, first yeah. of all, yeah, we do. I was like, Leron. I mean, 40% of gay people have kids. Yeah, I, I get that. But um, if you don't have kids... You still want the people that you work with to be able to read and write. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The ones who don't have a good education, you end up having to cover for them in the job because they can't do their job well. Right. Well, and all it is is it's it's increasing the divide between the haves and the Mm -hmm. Mm have-nots. And and I don't – my personal belief that there are some extreme GOP participants that – want to increase because they are in the haves Mm -hmm. and they just don't care about the have nots and my big answer because i do have like i'll run into i'll go dark uh door knocking and 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 they're like well i don't really care about education i don't have any kids and i'm like well do you have property like yeah i own my home and i'm like okay do you pay property taxes yeah okay well then you should care Mm -hmm. because again it's directly related to the state budget and so if they're not funding public education, public education is not going to go away despite any, you know, what do you want, private education for profit? So only those that can afford to go to school will go to school? Uh, and the I mean, is that really that is, what you want? Yes, but then, okay. some people want that. So, yeah, some people do. But let's look at the, let's just look at the practicality of that. Mm-hmm. All right, so we already have that in college, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We've already got that. So anyway, that's a whole other story. But, but I tell them, I was like, look, Right in the state of Texas, the way that we have decided <clears throat> to fund this <clears throat> puts half of that burden on the localities. And right now, it's more than half. It's over 60% um, is on the burden of the localities. So if you are a property owner or you want to be a property owner at some point in your life, you should be significantly interested in how we are funding public education. If you're a, an apartment dweller. Mm-hmm. Your rent part of that goes into property taxes, so it's a step away. But if property taxes go up higher, your rent goes exactly. up higher. Exactly, it's yep. directly related. So of course, it's directly related. You know, the other part of it in funding infrastructure is um, with the masterpiece cake uh, decision mm-hmm. recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I should have the right to deny service to somebody who, you know, my religious beliefs say that I just can't work with that person. Well, let's see, you've rented a, a, a space on a public street. Who paid for the street? Mm-hmm. Who paid for the sidewalks? Who paid for the, who pays for the fire and the police that protect you? All of that is everybody, and it's not right that somebody in this business says, I'm not doing business with you, but I will do business 
with you. Okay, well then, my portion of those tax dollars that are going to fix the sidewalk mm -hmm. outside your store, <clears throat> I'm going to come with a jackhammer and and take my sidewalk back. And take yeah, the sidewalk. <laughs> big old chunk of concrete. Uh -huh. Mine. <laughs> And it is. I, I totally agree. I totally so, agree. You know, it, it, it's not just education. It, it's everything. And we're going in the wrong direction on right. that kind of thing. And, and what they don't understand, this is what kills me, is the use of religion and the protection of religion within the Constitution. And the Constitution protects your right to practice your religion for you. Yep. It does mm -hmm. not, in any shape, form, or fashion, give you a right to oppose, to espouse those views or practice those views upon me. So it's an individual right. So the state cannot come in and go, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, whatever, you shall not worship on Sundays. That's what the Constitution protects you from. The Constitution does not give you the right to willfully discriminate against me as another person in this universe. But this, that's what they're seeking to do, and we see it across the country. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's not religious freedom. That is discrimination. And I guarantee you, almost all religious figures in the, what I have seen and read in religions would not champion division and hatred like that. Most of them are compassionate and caring and are about community and embracing, not But that's the point, though. Hatred. It's not about, it's really not about honoring your religious beliefs. It's about wanting to discriminate. Yeah. And what, what I think is so interesting is you see state legislatures across the country try to pass these things. And sadly, Mississippi's, which had been uh, the ACLU, had sued uh, the state of Mississippi not to enforce theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, they um, they lost. And so now it's legal in Mississippi to, to practice discrimination yep. through your religion. Mm -hmm. um, it's legal I, here. But I think it's interesting in like Oklahoma and other states that have introduced these bills to basically Jim Crow the LGBT community. That's mm -hmm. what they're doing. They wanted oh, to well, You know, Texas did that. Oh, yeah. As far as adoptions. Adoptions. Yes. yes. But right. they, they must provide Which you Which my opponent voted for, by the way. Yes. I'm sure she did. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I think it's interesting when it, comes to the, when it comes to the floor and there are Democrats who introduce bills to say, okay, well, you have to put a sign in your store and all of your online presence and in every advertising piece about who you will serve and who you will, will not. So if it's no gays, it needs to say that. No gays will be, you know, allowed. Fair notice. Yeah. And, um, and it just kills it for them because they don't want to own their bigotry. Exactly. No. no. Exactly. It, you know, they just they just curl up in, in, in a corner when they I, don't get I their I really way. thought this was settled with this, the civil rights era. You I know? did too. I was well, like, you can't... Uh, uh, you I, can't, I as a as a shop owner, say, okay, we're not. I don't believe blacks should have the right to have right. a public meal, so you can't sit at the counter. I thought the whole issue between separation of church and state was settled, settled like in years seventeen ago. something. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, just this week, Tennessee passed a law that allows public schools to uh, mandatory to teach the Bible in public schools. Oh, God. Oh, that's insane. Well, yeah, I, it's, I, I, you know, it's like, and it's interesting. And, and I just, just for the record, for all your listeners, I'm a Christian. I'm a practicing it, Christian. You know, I believe and, in Christ. And, and I Jesus, believe you know? in teaching the Bible for the literary work that it is. Because you need that stuff for crossword puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? I, I believe in comparative religion classes. What you can't do is have any of that. In mandate a public that school, to the exclusion of to, others. To mandate it, first of all, mm -hmm. but to um, to offer it in order to push that viewpoint. That violates the First Amendment. Yeah, I mean, a comparative religion course or 100%. a class just studying this book, it has tremendous historical value and it has great lessons in it. Mm -hmm. You teach it as literature, It's, I, th I think that's acceptable. Yeah. And now, but are, 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 is Tennessee going to allow other and, books of worship exactly. to be Exactly. Here's my issue because um, I have a nine-year-old daughter. And, uh, I, you know, I sent my child to private school from um, when she's pre-K to second grade. I sent her to the Dallas International School. And I sent her there because I re it was very important to me that she have a, uh, access and uh, exposure to people for, of different cultures. That that was extremely important to me, is that I wanted her to be able to have, 
understand conflict, conflict resolution, um, and in knowing that there are other cultures out there that you're going to have to deal, you know, learn to live with, and that they're no better than you, and you're no better than them. That this, so that was my priority. And when I was looking at that, and I was looking, a lot of the private schools here, and especially in Dallas, are Christian or Catholic. And again, I'm a Christian, but here's the deal. The way that I practice and interpret Christianity is completely and totally different than the way Dan Patrick practices Absolutely. and teaches Christianity. And so if you're teaching that in school, well, whose version are you teaching? Right. right. Mm -hmm. That's my problem. Right. And that's why I refuse to send my child to a, a, a school that was faith-based because I don't know which version of Christ you're presenting to my child. And I want to make sure it's the compassionate one that believes in community, that believes in brotherhood and sisterhood, mm -hmm. that teaches you to embrace those that are different from you and not to exclude and condemn. Mm -hmm. So and they care about the poor and they care right, about those they care, Exactly. Yep. So that's the, but that's not necessarily the one you're going to get in a, different, a lot of these schools. We need to take a break. We're talking to Brandy Chambers. She's running for Texas House District 112 in the November election. Um, we'll be back and we have to talk about bathrooms more because that's all the legislature seems to understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we want to give you some practice in that. Great. <laughs> uh, this is Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet with Laurent Landis and the late Patty Fink. And we'll be back with more right after this. Hey, guys. I'm C.D. Kirby. And you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON-FM. And this is Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Ron Landis and the late Patty Fink. And we are talking to Brandy Chambers. She's running for Texas House District 112. Uh, Brandy's an uh, employment attorney, and um, she has something in common with her opponent. There is one issue. You aren't here yet, Patty. Um, do, <laughs> they're do you women. Guess what freaking it was? Out they're women. <laughs> yeah, well, no, they don't agree on that either. <laughs> 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 no, they agree they're both women. But on the issue of how do you treat women, do right. you treat them equally? Agree. Yeah, there's yeah, no agree with. Yeah. Do you want to tell Patty what this one issue is? Uh, from what I've been able to see from her uh, legislative record is she is a supporter of animal rights. And really? And treatment of animals. And I'm very much for that. I am an animal owner, and that is the only thing I can find that we would have voted the same way on. Interesting. Wow. Yep. The only one. Wow. <laughs> well, here's another issue I bet. I'm just going to guess that you all probably don't agree on. It's marijuana. Oh, I bet that. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen, I mean, any, she doesn't put anything out, so I, I, it's hard to say. I can only look at the voter record and... and you know, not a lot of the pot legislation makes it to the floor. Okay, so I have so, your new campaign slogan. What's that? When they go low, we get high. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never been high. I know, no, I'm, I'm a pro pot supporter. I completely and totally support the decriminalization and the legalization without civil uh, repercussions of marijuana for many different reasons. But I have never myself ingested in any form or fashion THC. I know Same here. a and lot I, of people I don't agree. believe me, especially because I'm from Muskogee, Oklahoma, where there's a song that says we don't get high. And most of my <laughs> friends did. I did not. Um, but yeah, I always like to set the record straight on there. I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, I have a lot of personal history that relates directly to the, how marijuana should be treated, uh, which if we have time, I can go sure. into. Okay, so one thing, my grandfather um, passed away recently, last October, and he had Parkinson's. And in the latter years of his life, uh, his Parkinson's became pretty devastating and it also affected not only his shaking and his ability to maintain bodily functions but also to eat. Um, he couldn't feed himself and uh, he had no appetite whatsoever um, and so through the help of my uncle who lives in Colorado we were able to a state by the way a state yes where yes. Um, there's recreational marijuana available yes. yes legally yes so they did try i mean the doctors and my grandfather's in oklahoma the doctors would you know give him different medications 
all pills all had massive side effects he was seeing spiders crawl over the wall i mean it was just a bad mm-hmm. situation and one of the only things that was able to bring him any sort of comfort and relief and i don't mean like oh let's get high comfort but as in would calm the parkinson's would give him enough of an appetite to eat uh, was marijuana mm-hmm. it seems so, to be useful for epilepsy yes. for a number of diseases that are so and yeah, then on the other side of like that uh, i have a alternative issue that has deeply affected my life i'm going to try to talk about that crying is i uh have a cousin that got in a really bad car wreck and he jammed up his knee really bad and he needed surgery he didn't have any health insurance so he couldn't have it um so they gave him oxycotton mm. oh my to help with the pain he got addicted uh when the doctor stopped prescribing the oxycotton he turned to heroin uh, of course, and all of this was unbeknownst to the family at the time, um, and he deeply fell into the heroin life and ended up dying alone from an overdose on the bathroom floor of a halfway house. Oh, my gosh. He was not found until late in the afternoon, and the only reason he was found is because he died in the bathroom, which was a shared bathroom, and so people kept banging on the door to get in the bathroom. Someone had to finally... Locked. It was locked. Someone had to finally go around the back of the house, climb up in the window, and they found him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is extremely difficult for me. And the reason I bring this up is because heroin and marijuana are treated the same in the federal laws. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily believe that all drugs should be treated equally and I do think that there should be a war on drugs but we need to make sure we're being smart about which drugs we have the war on heroin we need to have a war on heroin but at no point when I see a drug that can help my grandfather who was dying versus my cousin who died due to heroin should not be treated the same and so I also know and strongly believe that if my cousin was prescribed a marijuana or something similar instead of an opiate to deal with his pain, he may still be alive today. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's duplicated and replicated across the country right. and, and millions of families. It, it is. Um, one of my dear friends at this exact moment is battling liver cancer. I can't tell you how many times I've been up to the hospital to see him in the past six months. And he was in excruciating pain. They could not give him enough um, pain medication. And he was still saying, I'm in pain. He's finally been released. Um, It is fatal, but they're trying to just keep him comfort. And his doctor did tell him, you know, if you could get maybe some marijuana. He did. His appetite has increased. He said, this is I don't. I hardly feel any pain anymore. Mm-hmm. He's actually gained a little weight now. Good. Wow. Good, good, All good. because yeah. of the marijuana. And the difference between the effects of marijuana and morphine. Exactly. I mean, huge difference. Huge oh, difference. Absolutely. Nine days. Do you know there's another thing that um, legalizing marijuana cures? Not having enough money to fund education. True. Absolutely. Because I'm Colorado, for that. Yeah. with their 27 percent tax on it, that people are clamoring to spend. You know, talk about a tax that people are happy to pay. Right. But I will, I mean, it's, 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 it, when we, and I say when, not if, when we pass the legalization for marijuana in all forms and fashion, I do believe we need to tax it. And we need to tax not only the growth of it, um, the sell of it, but also the export of it, um, because I think that could be a great source of financial revenue for the state of Texas. But I don't want to do it punitively. Because I still want it to be more economical to get it from a safe environment than from somebody on the street Mm -hmm. that may have laced it with something or, you know, whatever. So I want to make sure we're not handling, handing a heavier tax on that to basically still price it out of the drug cartels. Okay, so I want to be careful of that. But yet, and then when all of that happens and we get that taxation, I want it completely and totally dedicated to public education. Mm -hmm. Not to the general fund. It cannot go into the general fund because if it goes in the general fund, then we're now subsidizing the rainy day fund. Yeah. You know, it rained in Houston and we didn't 
Abbott wouldn't use money from the rainy yes, day fund. Exactly. Which ugh, anyway, so it has to go straight into public education only. It can right. only be used for a teacher's retirement, for a teacher's retirement and healthcare, for bigger classrooms, for fixing our moldy schools. And simply, you know, let's have that be the Robin Hood plan. Mm-hmm. And but I mean, you can't get into. And it. I believe Colorado's. I don't know if all of it goes to education or just a portion of it does, but. They have a. They're running a surplus right now. Oh, big oh. time! And here's the problem because we have a Neanderthal for Attorney General in this country <sighs> who thinks marijuana needs to be attacked and clamped down on, and like, <sighs> you know it's it's no different than OxyContin. Um, but the Colorado has a, has a surplus of cash because mm-hmm. all these local governments are t- accepting their ta- their portion of the tax, and the state's accepting their portion of cash and cash because federal law says you cannot you put the proceeds into a bank, right. into a, into a federally insured bank, which most banks are. And so um, here they have these vault the vault rooms of cash, and they're paying well, like me. they're paying like. <laughs> Like road crews, when they do a road project in With Colorado, cash? they're paying them in cash because it's there. They can't, right. they can't deposit mm-hmm. it. So, mm-hmm. um, imagine having that problem. That's a great problem to have. Yep. Where do we put all the cash <laughs> as a public entity? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever been? To, have you been to Colorado since they've legalized? No, I haven't. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Did you go into one of the dispensaries? I did not. It, it once they check your ID, they buzz you in. You go up to the counter and they show you their fine varietals and this one's good for this. I love and this it. It's one's like a good. wine store. It, and it's it, it's exactly run like it's a uh, like you're buying a fine. But you can wine. get like gummies and and they'll show you those two on a platter and it, it, it's very <laughs> elegantly Here's your displayed and, you know, <laughs> and and as one of my cousins said to her mom, "Oh no, mom, I want to pay for your first pot." <laughs> I don't ever First imagine having free. that conversation with my mother. <laughs> right? Don't. I can see my daughter having that conversation with me. <laughs> so anyway, um, so let's get let's get back to the the bathroom bill. Okay. This is going to come up again in January, mm-hmm. guaranteed. No, probably. Um, I, you know, it, it's going to take a little while. I have to get past this. Um, you know, the speaker election and. All of the mm-hmm. the gobbledygook that goes with that, mm-hmm. but assuming we get um, we get past that and and bills are introduced, there are a range of bills that are incredibly anti LGBT, and we know that the GOP platform um, itself, which I mean, a, a party platform doesn't always mean anything, but there are twenty like twenty four anti LGBT planks in this GOP platform. They were serious about it, right? Um, Why? It, it, they, they because hate otherwise they'd have to deal with health care that most people want. I guess not everybody, but... Or public education or something. And public education, and they'd have to deal with immigration, and they'd have to deal with the economy. And it's easier who wants to the, do those things? It's clears. easier to attack people that don't affect you. Well, so they're taking the Trump plan. Mm-hmm. Oh, That's oh yeah. So, so in, in all of this, we're going to get another bathroom bill, and we're probably going to get some sort of license to discriminate. Uh, mm-hmm. This, this mm-hmm. What, so-called An additional license religious to liberty mm-hmm. <coughs> attempt. Um, so um, will you be joining that coalition of people on the House floor who will be saying not no, but hell no? I'll be leading that. <laughs> I'm going to bring a ladder and a big poster board and a microphone. What are those things? What are the things? The megaphone. Horse? Megaphone. megaphone. Yeah. 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 No. I. That. I mean. That. I mean. That's legitimately why I'm running because I'm just sick of that crap. Sorry, I said crap. It's okay. okay. It's okay. not one of the seven words. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to. You say crap all day. Okay. Sorry. I, sorry. I said worse. So okay. Good. No, I've said a lot worse, but hopefully not on public radio. Um. So no. I mean, that's that's just what I'm. It's like our. Our priorities by the leadership are just so askew of everyday life, um, like the attack on women and, and abortion and all this stuff. And I'm just like, okay, when I'm talking to people, how does that affect you in your everyday life? Mm-hmm. Right. Tell me that. How does that affect you? How does whoever is using the bathroom affect you every day? And they, no one has an answer. I'm like, then why isn't the things that actually affect us every day? on the top of our priority list. Right. You know, we only have a couple of minutes left and I did want to get this in because this is one of your issues that other candidates haven't really talked about and that's uh, human trafficking. Correct. Tell us what your thoughts okay, are on Okay, so there's um, 
I want to introduce legislation to assist entities in being able to identify high-risk victims for human trafficking to basically stop the supply chain. So right now, in the city of Dallas, every night there's at least 400 kids on the street. There's be, and I say kids, and when I'm talking about human trafficking in this particular situation, I'm talking about minors. Mm -hmm. um, 400 kids a night that are victims of human trafficking in the city of Dallas every night. Texas is number two in the nation of most human trafficking victims. Number two. Wow. That is huge wow. in the nation, okay? We are the major pipeline for human trafficking. When a child runs away, a minor runs away for every reason, they are approached by a pimp within 48 hours. Wow. Okay, so there, there are significant issues. There is a Dallas City um, Police Department did a social autopsy of this, what ended up being a victim that ended up dying because the victim had been in the system, thought some things had, you know, they basically just blew her off as a prostitute. She ended up being dead. So a sergeant finally did the social, like, what did we miss? What, what happened here? Come to find out that uh, early on, there are certain red flags that are common in every deal. One is truancy. But the truancy department or agency that monitors that doesn't have any right or ability to share that information with any other governmental entity. The next red flag found is CPS and interventions. Mm -hmm. They don't get to share any information. And then next inter uh, interaction is with law enforcement because now they are deemed prostitutes right. and are now are treated as criminals and not uh. as victims. Right? Right. So one thing is if we can get it to where a system that not only are you allowed, but you are mandated to share information between the truancy, CPS, and law enforcement to show, hey, we've got a lot of hits on this one kid. We need to go figure out what's going on. What's happening in this home? Why does this person keep running away? Why are they not showing up to school? Because nine times out of ten, it's not a disciplinary issue. It's an issue about, it's a symptom of a dysfunctional home life. Right. When you have the dysfunctional home life, you have a kid that eventually is gonna learn how to survive and leave and get out on the street. Once they're out on the street, easy prey. Easy wow. prey. So I want, that's one of the things that I wanna do. I wanna stop the pipeline, get in there early while we can save these kids because there's enough signs there, there's enough science there that we can say, hey, wait we're concerned mm -hmm. let's get in there and help you before you end up being trafficked yeah but bathrooms i know bathrooms and you know hillary's emails mm -hmm. and yeah and benghazi and benghazi um brandy i want to thank you <laughs> yeah. very thank much you for so being much, on thank uh, you guys yeah. i appreciate Going it again. for district 112 Absolutely. before we go um i forgot to read this earlier but uh next sunday's kanoan film festival will feature every night is saturday night the life and times of bobby key's sax player with the rolling stones and session player with music less let music less legend this is why I don't do um, PSAs. Featuring appearances from Keith Richards, Ron Wood, uh, Charlie Watts, uh, Joe Ely, and others. Uh, for more information and tickets, go to KNON.org. The KNON Film Festival will be at the Texas Theater 231 West Jefferson in Oak Cliff. And I think Ken Upton is our guest next week I from so. Lambda Lethal. And thanks, everybody, for being with us. Thank we'll you. See you next week. <laughs> Thank you.